Hello. In this next talk, I will talk about the regulation of gene networks by microRNAs or miRNAs. So in the previous talk, I introduced the expanding world of RNAs, non-coding RNAs primarily. Um, and in this next talk, I will talk to you mostly about microRNAs and how they work, how they regulate gene networks, and what are the consequences of altered microRNA expression, which you will see later can have also relevance to the skin and to skin diseases. This is the tree of RNA types I showed before. This is just uh, for you to remember again, microRNAs, they belong to the class of short RNAs within the bigger group of regulatory RNAs. And then there are some others, siRNAs, PRNAs, and so on. MicroRNAs are the best characterized group of, long of uh, short non-coding RNAs. They are around 22 nucleotides long, so they are really, really short, and that is how they got their name. So why do we need microRNAs at all? This is where we stopped in the previous talk, and why do we have so many? So again, back to the flow of information, uh, from DNA to RNA to protein to function. Now, these processes have to be very tightly regulated, and especially in complex organisms like humans. So the, the extent and also the timing of uh, gene expression is very important when uh, while building up a, a, a big uh, building up and make it functional so the complex organisms like humans and also other complex animals and for this tight regulation this is only possible if there are several steps several levels of regulation and uh, what i mentioned in the beginning showing epigenetics one step is methylation of the dna for example histone acetylation then we have regulation at the transcriptional level by transcription factors, RNA splicing, by which uh, you can get different proteins from the same RNA. And then at the protein level, phosphorylation, glycosylation, also protein folding, ubiquitination. So there are many, many, many steps to control gene expression and by that cellular functions. And microRNAs, well, who needed another level, you may think. That's another level of, of regulation, but actually our cells really need it. Uh, and microRNAs regulate gene expression, we say at the post-transcriptional level. So between the messenger RNA and the protein. And typically microRNAs suppress protein production. Uh, we have more than 2,500 microRNAs in human. And each microRNA regulates several genes. It would be very simple if it would be like, as it shows in this figure, one microRNA one suppresses one protein. This is not the case. Each microRNA regulates dozens to hundreds of target genes. And uh, in this way, they can regulate gene networks. And typically, they have a quite mild effect on one target. However, since they regulate several genes at the same time, they can have a substantial effect on the activity of pathways and also on cellular functions. I will show you examples of that later. So what is also important when we talk about microRNA mediated gene expression is that microRNAs regulate the majority of protein coding genes. Meaning that if you have any protein coding genes, which is your favorite, which you want to study, the chances that a microRNA is regulating it are higher than that it is not. Because more than 60% of our protein coding genes are regulated by microRNAs. So if they are so important, are they? And what happens uh, if we don't have any microRNAs? Well, uh, in uh, animals like mice, this has been studied. And the very first attempts uh, to find out what would happen without microRNAs uh, they were done in this way that enzymes which are needed for the processing of microRNAs such as Drosha, Dysa, or a protein called Ego2 uh, were knocked out uh, in mice. In this way, uh, we could, uh, one could ensure that these animals do not have any microRNAs. And what happened? Well, uh, these, have, these animals had a very similar phenotype, all three, 
So they got a developmental arrest about embryonic day 5.5 to 7.5. So without microRNAs, these mice did not make it very far. But this is a very crude approach. Uh, in this way, we get rid of all of the microRNAs and also uh, from the beginning, very early. So since then, there have been some knockout and transgenic animal models of individual microRNAs to find out what is the contribution of individual microRNAs to different phenotypes. And uh, these uh, uh, experiments, these knockout animals, uh, have informed us about the importance of individual microRNAs. And almost every biological process we know is regulated by microRNAs. For example, stem cell differentiation, tissue and organ development, cell cycle control, apoptosis, and metabolism. So how are microRNAs produced in our cells? They are encoded in our DNA, just as any other genes. So they are genes, microRNA genes. And then I will show you in the short video what happens and how microRNAs are made and how they function. So this is the cell nucleus. Within the cell nucleus, the microRNA gene is transcribed from the DNA to RNA, like any other gene, like protein coding genes. And then this is the primary transcript, the pri mRNA. This is processed into a hairpin precursor, which is then exported from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and further processed first to a double-stranded and then to a single-stranded mature microRNA. Now this is the microRNA which the mature uh, which can exert its effects together with proteins called the risk complex. It can bind to the target messenger RNA and inhibit protein synthesis. So this is what this short video showed us. So it is the mature microRNA, which is only like 19 to 22 nucleotides long. This is what forms complex with the risk, binds to the three prime untranslated region of the target messenger RNA and typically suppresses the translation or induces messenger RNA degradation. The risk is a, an abbreviation for the RNA induced silencing complex. And the expression of microRNA genes accordingly is controlled at multiple levels. In a way, just like other genes, protein coding genes, they are controlled at the DNA level by mutations. There can be mutations in microRNA genes, deletions, amplifications, or translocations. They can also themselves be epigenetically regulated by promoter methylation, histone modifications, and so on. They can be regulated transcriptionally but then in addition to these levels, which, which are also present for protein coding genes, they can also be regulated at the level of biogenesis and each step of it, and also the cytoplasmic export. So all these, uh, all these steps can regulate how, many, how much of a, of a single microRNA we have in our cells. So how do they work? They bind to the three prime untranslated region uh, of the target genes, target messenger RNAs. So, so they do not bind to the protein coding region, but the, this region which is after that. And there is a base pairing, but, but there is not a um, full sequence complementarity, just a partial one. And uh, we know that there is a sequence which is uh, especially important for the base pairing. This is the nucleotide two to seven from the five prime end of the mature microRNA. And this is what is important in defining target specificity and the basis of the action of the microRNAs. And when they bind to the ergoprotein, then this prepares the microRNA for binding to the three, three prime untranslated region of the target gene. And the basis of it is simple watson crick base pairing between the microRNA and the target messenger RNA. So again, this just shows this in another way. The seed region is important in defining the uh, target specificity, but since this complementary is only complementarity is only partial, you cannot really say in advance just by looking at the sequence which microRNA will regulate which protein coding gene. There are some ways, bioinformatic uh, algorithms, 
to make predictions, but these predictions also have a lot of false positives. So you need to experimentally verify which microRNA regulates actually which target. There are microRNAs uh, which are different, but their seed sequence is the same or very similar. And these microRNAs uh, are, belong to the same microRNA family because they have uh, overlapping or the same target genes because the seed sequence is uh, the same. So this is what we call microRNA families. And there are many microRNAs which belong to families like this. And this is quite smart of evolution. If one of them is lost, then we still have the others. And this is just another way to show that uh, this partial complementarity, how important and, and the seed sequence, how important it is. So what defines the targeting? If there is no base pairing, of course, in this kinetic studies, they show there is, of course, no uh, interaction. Uh, but also know when it's three or four or five nucleotides uh, which can uh, do the base pairing. From six uh, base pairing, you can see uh, the interactions and from seven, the interaction is stable. So you could think, well, well, this is a little bit similar to siRNAs, what you use in your experiments. It's siRNAs or silencing RNAs. Um, so what's the difference? Well, actually silencing RNAs that we use in experimental research, they use exactly the microRNA machinery. So we hijack the system, we use the microRNA machinery to uh, regulate our gene of interest, to silence our gene of interest. But there are some important differences, even if the machinery is the same. So siRNAs are fully complementary to their targets, while microRNAs, as I just showed, they have a partial complementarity. Uh, and since they are fully complementary siRNAs, they induce the cleavage of the target messenger RNA, while microRNAs typically, at least in human, they induce translational repression and or, my, or messenger RNA degradation and not so often the cleavage of the target. And also one important consequence of the full complementarity of siRNAs is that they regulate one specific target. This is what we want in our experiments. MicroRNAs, on the other hand, they have multiple targets. As I showed, since it's just a partial complementarity, they can bind to multiple targets at the same time. And since they can bind to multiple targets, they can control signal transduction pathways and gene networks very efficiently. So typically, one microRNA regulates one target uh, uh, in, a, in a mild way, just uh, the extent of silencing is not as high as with siRNAs. However, since they regulate several genes within the same pathway, the effect, the net effect on the pathway will be very significant. And well, these gene networks can be very complex. We have over 2,000 microRNA genes in human. And the number that I mentioned before, at least 60% of our protein coding genes are targeted by microRNAs. The emergence of the microRNAs will not make the understanding of the regulatory networks much easier. I will here show you some examples how microRNAs can regulate gene networks. So microRNAs are quite often involved in different regulatory loops. One example for it is feed-forward loops. This is one example, regulation of MIR-34 by P53. So as we know, P53 uh, is important, uh, is, a, is, a, is an important protein also actually in, in, in the skin as a response to, to uh, DNA, DNA damage, for example, P53 is activated and uh, regulates at the transcriptional level genes that suppress cell proliferation, that suppress survival, to be able to repair the DNA damage, or if that is not possible, to drive the cells to apoptosis. But at the same time, P53 also induces MIR-34, which is a microRNA, uh, and, and MIR-34 silences genes that would be, uh, uh, that, would, that would promote cell proliferation and survival. So the effect will be the same, 
the effect will be strengthened. So these microRNAs that are involved in these feedforward loops, they reinforce the strength of the signal, they increase the robustness of the pathway. It will be a dual level regulation, uh, both at the transcriptional level here, but also here at the post-transcriptional level of other genes which have the same biological effect. Another very typical way how microRNAs can work is that they are involved in negative feedback loops. And negative feedback loops are quite common in biology. And uh, one example is skin inflammation. If you get an infection or a trauma, uh, you get an inflammatory response, but this, this response has to be at some point shut down. Otherwise, if you cut your finger, you would get a cytokine storm and the sepsis. But, but the inflammatory response normally is shut down. And, and uh, partially this is because of the uh, feedback loops that shut down the inflammatory pathways in the cells. And microRNAs, they are very, very suitable for these uh, negative feedback loops. And why is that? Because their biogenesis is faster than that of proteins, and also because there are multiple target genes of each microRNA which are in the same pathway. So this is, for example, if a, a, a transcription factor is activated by an external trigger, for example, and this induces a microRNA, which in turn uh, silences the transcription factor, then this will be a negative feedback loop. And often it's also that they have other targets within the same uh, pathway. So this type of feedback loop increases the stability of system, but also provides an, an appropriate response to the initial trigger, controls the extent and the duration of the response. I show you one example here. So MIR-146A is a microRNA that, that uh, we have studied in the skin and in keratinocytes. Uh, MIR-146A is induced by different inflammatory triggers, both by toll-like receptors, innate immune triggers, but also, as you see in this figure, by interleukin 17A, an important inflammatory cytokine. So, uh, and, the, and the induction of MIR-146A happens through NF-kappa B, the, the transcription factor, uh, the same transcription factor, which also uh, is involved in the inflammatory response. And then uh, MIR-1A46A, when it is induced by this inflammatory trigger, it feeds back, it silences TREF6 and shuts down the response when it is needed. So this is an example to a microRNA, which uh, is involved in a negative feedback loop, controls the immune, innate immune responses and inflammatory responses of keratinocytes. Uh, feedback circuits can also be double negative. They can serve as bistable switches in which, for example, a transcription factor expression is high. It suppresses the microRNA, which leads to even higher expression of the transcription factor, which further suppresses the microRNA, leading to development of program A. Very stable switch. Or if the microRNA is high, it leads to lower transcription factor expression, which allows higher microRNA expression. So then you get another state with high microRNA and low transcription factor expression, developmental program B. So this feedback fixes, stabilizes developmental programs. The so microRNAs are involved in almost all biological processes uh, where they have been studied according to how they work. And these are some examples of physiological processes uh, which have been shown to be modulated by microRNAs. Since they regulate almost all genes, they uh, play a role in almost each, each and every biological process. And also their altered expression can lead to pathological processes. Here are some examples. I would just like to show you one example from the cancer field. Many cancer-associated microRNAs regulate cell proliferation, apoptosis, differentiation, and stemness. It is very common that in cancers, microRNA expression is changed. Tumor suppressor microRNAs, for example, target proto-oncogenes under physiological circumstances, and they are downregulated in cancer, allowing the expression of proto-oncogenes. 
oncogenic RNAs. Oncomeres, on the other hand, they target tumor suppressor genes, often upregulated in cancer, and allow the uncontrolled expression of oncogenes. This is one prime example, oncomere addiction. Some microRNAs are so important in some cancer types that uh, these cancers are dependent on the activity of a single microRNA. For example, overexpression of MIR21 in mice leads to B-cell lymphoma, but if, you, if we suppress it, it leads to very quick remission. So in summary, microRNAs regulate gene expression at the post-transcriptional level. We have many microRNAs and uh, more than 2,500 in human. Each microRNA has multiple targets, often within the same pathway. These microRNAs are often involved in feedback loops, positive, negative, bistable switch feedback loops. And altered expression of microRNAs, accordingly, they can lead to altered cellular functions and ultimately to diseases. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>